no um, accolades for finding the way here today. I just got in John's car <laughs> from my house, so, so that's fine. Um, but it is good to be with you. And what I'd also say is whatever it says on the program that we're going to be talking about, probably don't believe it. Um, but um, John, John, John is going to, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I've got the brief to do a bit of a brief introduction now. And we hand over to John, who's going to share some reflections um, based on some research that he's doing into diaspora um, mis mission and missiology. And then I'm going to take the liberty of talking back to whatever it is that John shares. This is a highly polished piece that we're doing. <laughs> you know, we, we planned it thoroughly this morning. <laughs> but I'm talking back to what John shares with you. And then we are very, very happy to take whatever questions you've got, including about things that might not actually be on the table today. But as Fiona says, you might have picked up things that we are involved in, that we're working with. And if you've got any questions, then very, very welcome. I'm going to hand over to John with his oh. capable hands. I thought you would take longer. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. As you've been informed, my name is John McCauley. And today is a great day, isn't it, as we, we assemble at one of the events to celebrate the 50th anniversary of our beloved United Reformed Church. As we celebrate our ministry and mission in the United Kingdom, but also on the global stage. This paper will start with a personal testimony, as I am a URC minister. I will then share some thoughts with regards to some academic concept with regards to diaspora, um, ministry and mission, and ethnic minority people as a travel with their faith, and see how we relate to that one way or the other. And then I would link it up with uh, my journey and our journey as a denomination, the United Reformed Church. I would also make some suggestions as the way forward and also end with a conclusion. Let me start with my personal testimony. I stand very humble, but delighted to say I am one of the many people from all over the world who have been welcomed into the United Reformed Church. Called by God at the age of 16, to serve him I responded to his call and was trained by the Methodist Church in Sierra Leone and ordained in 1986. Same year I came to the UK and did my masters at the Birmingham University and went back. Some, some years after, I returned to the UK. The Methodists were after me. <laughs> but they were too slow. The URC first got hold of me. I was doing a job in Waltham Forest. In those days, it was called black lead and white lead churches. And my, my job was as a multicultural worker to bring these um, different strands or traditions of churches together. And that was where the URC saw me. And um, the rest is history. So in 1993, I joined the URC, and this year in November, I will be a URC minister for 29 years. I've got good news for you. I'm delighted to inform you that it has been the best 29 years of my life. 
Ask me why. Because the UMC has brought the best out of me and my churches have enabled me to be joined in Christ. I will also be honest to say that of course there have been challenges along the way, some of which I will return to later in my paper. But enough of me. But I stand to say that the URC is a church of welcome. Let us give the URC a clap. Come on, we can do that. <laughs> Let me share some of my research interests that relates to migration and ethnic minorities to the UK, and particularly the United Reform Church. My research interest is in diaspora mission, sometimes diaspora missiology, but it combines migration and mission in the academic circles, such as practical theology. Diaspora missiology is a, is a framework for understanding the participating in God's redemptive mission. The concepts of diaspora missiology has emerged because of two global trends, which are the demographic reality of diaspora people and the shift, third center of the gravity of Christianity in the 21st century from the West to the rest and from the Northern Hemisphere to the South. Diaspora missiology is about exploring new ways of thinking in the field of missiology to supplement traditional missiology to cope with and understand the reality of people migrating on a global scale in the 21st century according to Enoch White. This paper, focusing on black and ethnic minorities in the URC, connects to the field of diaspora missiology as it embraces Enoch White's two main criteria for this diaspora missiology, which are the demographic flow of immigrants to London and countries in the majority world are now becoming missionaries of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Kasti Kima, a renowned theologian, talks about the multi-directional flow of mission, which is a mission is no longer from the west to the rest but mission is from everywhere to everywhere. Even though Inokwan talks about diaspora communities in Britain and states that worshippers from black communities are rising, his work does not reflect the diaspora mission of any diaspora community in our historic churches in the UK. Also, Kimanma doing a study on diaspora missiology on Korean immigrants challenges traditional thinking about mission, two of which are that only rich nations can do mission and that mission is usually from the developed countries to the underdeveloped countries. Traditional thinking of mission is territorial. It's usually about financial power, influence, and superiority. And it flows from one direction. The other concept that is around today is what is referred to as reverse mission. Anybody heard of reverse mission? Well, reverse mission. I honestly must say I, I'm not so much in favor with the term, but I like the issues it raises. There are two schools of thought, I think one could say about, or according to my understanding. One school fo focuses on the failures of reverse mission to attract, the, to attract and sustain adherents from the native host population and therefore questions its validity. Scholars such as Preston and Cato are of this persuasion and consider the reverse mission concept as rhetoric and not a demonstrable reality. Possibly I should say, for those, those of you who may not know, is that reverse mission tries to bring together the understanding of... Sorry, can you just spell that word? 
Which one? From your other mission. We, we passed the mission? Yes. We passed. Uh, we, we, uh, we passed. Yeah, we passed. Yeah. You got it? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Now, it, it's really trying to say, well, in the past, Western countries, churches, have been to Africa, Asia, around the world, taking the gospel. And now what is happening, churches and pastors and missionaries from these countries are coming back, <coughs> not only to the United Kingdom, but to Western countries. And so they say, mission is now reversed. So this first school of thought saying that it is questionable are not valid. And people are interested and cattle of this persuasion. The other school of thought is that reverse mission is a demonstrable phenomenon and should not be assessed only by attracting members of the host population. I put scholars like Burgess and Adogam and Olaf Binjani in the second school of thought. Burgess actually argues that in London, African churches are becoming an increasingly important addition to the urban religious landscape and affirms their enormous contribution to life in the city, which he refers to as civic engagement. In humility, I advocate for a third school of thought, which I call global mission, which is extending the study of black and ethnic minorities beyond, beyond the indigenous churches which the vast mission said to do, and I think, therefore, it is limited. To my mind, the URC and many other historic churches have done their fair share and best, and the URC, I believe, has done a good job in welcoming people from ethnic minorities. What is very interesting for us to recognize is that as we celebrate 50 years, we need to understand that in some historic churches, including our own beloved URC, the presence of black and ethnic minorities is, a very, is very significant to our ministry and mission. The reverse mission concept does not acknowledge this, but the global mission does. And by global mission, I mean that God is in charge, God is in control. There is this story about Jesus and Nicodemus, and at one point Jesus said, oh boy, you can hear the wind. You can hear it. But you don't know where it's coming from, nor where it is going. So it is with everyone that is born of God. And I think that's how I understand what is happening in our world today in terms of migration and mission. And when you look at reverse mission, it has so many limitations. For instance, the Western countries go to Africa, for example, and say, these guys are pagans. They don't know God. Let's take Jesus to them. Now, the African countries, Africans are coming here now, and say, God is dead in the United Kingdom. Let's bring Jesus back here. They don't know God. And for me, it seems as if human beings are taking credit for the work of God, which I think is wrong. But I think the, the global mission, it's about taking any inner city community where our church is served. You have 20 people from Ireland, 20 from Scotland, 20 from Nigeria, 20 from Jamaica, 20 from India, all living in this inner city. And guess what? On a Sunday morning, when we open our doors, they're all coming. The global assembly in the local, which for me connects more with the Missio Dei, whereby we join in with the Spirit, we don't take credit for God's work, but we join in it. And I think that's why I am advocating for um, the global mission. Let's come back home now a little bit. 
migration and the United Reform Church. My research has found that in the past 50 years, there has been like four waves of migration to our beloved United Reformed Church. And they are worth celebrating. What are they, you might ask? Well, the Caribbeans, first wave, the Africans, second wave, the Asians, third wave, East Europeans, fourth wave, and I'm sure I could honestly say there may be others I am not aware of that you may be aware of. But it all shows that as a church, we have been welcoming different waves of migration into our church. This is fascinating and historically valuable because if we withdraw these inner, these migrants from our inner city churches, majority of them will close down if not all of them, will close down. So a very significant historical fact as we celebrate 50 years. Something else we should be proud of as we celebrate 50 years. Um, the General Secretary is here, so I better be careful what I say. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if I am, if I'm, if I'm right, we may have approximately 40 ministers, CRCW, from black and ethnic minority backgrounds. And I think that's quite good. And on this occasion, if you could put your hands together and applaud the United Republic. Please, please, please. please, please. Sometimes we have to. It's 50 years. It's 50, it's 50 years. In addition to that, we have two partners in mission serving us from Taiwan and Korea. At this point, I've just wrote down, long live the URC. What has been our response to migration? It's immigrants among us. What have we done as a denomination to celebrate and embrace everyone as we respond to the various waves of migration in our beloved church. One thing we have done that relates well with our structure is that we have passed a series of resolutions. Some of you may not be aware of them, but let me just remind you of some, not all of them. In 1994, commitment to listening to the voices of people of different cultural backgrounds and adoption of an equal opportunities policy. In 2005, URC declared itself a multicultural church, welcoming all cultures and ethnicities in worship, witness, and service. In 2012, multicultural church, intercultural habitat, building on the earlier multicultural church understanding. And in 2020, the anti-racist church resolution, whereby the URC is committed itself to a journey from not racist to actively anti-racist. All these resolutions were taken and passed at our General Assembly because we are aware that to be the church God wants us to be, we need to be an inclusive church. Another question we need to ask is, as we celebrate 50 years, how far or how much have these resolutions been carried out to reflect the church we need and desire to be? The reality is not much has been done. I was talking to somebody the other day and I said to this person, well, we all belong to the URC. And the URC's business is our business together. What we need to do is to keep on encouraging one another to do the best we can. And I said to him, I'm a, I'm a father of two, two, well, I wouldn't say two boys, they, they are men now. I'm a father of two men. But, Sometimes, 
I make promises to them, but I don't pay. And they gently remind me, Dad, you said it. Yeah. I think now is the time whereby we need to remind the UFC, lovingly and gently, in 2020, in 2005, in 1910, whatever, you didn't promise. Hey, what about returning back to those promises? And the person was amused. I said, well, that's how it's going to be. Because we are together, and we've got to do things together. Well, we might be reflective in asking ourselves, why do we just pass resolutions and do nothing about them? This is wrong. It is an attitude that needs to be changed. I was at our minister's conference, gathering, some time ago in May. And I heard one of our distinguished ministers say, quoting James Baldwin, that which we cannot face cannot be changed. And that is so too. Ask me afterwards who said that, and I will tell you. <laughs> we may find ourselves celebrating a jubilee that no one wanted. But I am convinced that God wanted it. And it is now here, and we are part of it. If we consider some theological considerations of the Jubilee, it may help us to change our mindset as we join in as a denomination. Again, at the same minister's gathering, Dr. Maguire, our Old Testament tutor in Manchester, in the same gathering, she was giving some reflections on Jubilee, looking at Leviticus. She made some points that I still remember up to this day. She spoke of the need to loose your grip on the land. I said to myself, wow, what a teacher. You may somehow think you own the land but see yourselves as aliens and strangers in the land. Let me tell you now why I say wow. Coming from the Methodist background, it's the first time I've really used John Wesley's expression applying it to myself. Like John Wesley, I felt my heart strangely warm. I received the inspiration there and then which I now share with you for the first time. Loose your grip on the land. The land is the United Reformed Church. Its structure and some members of its church are now asked by the mercy of God to loosen their grip on the UFC to such an extent that we make ethnic minorities members feel they own this land as much as we do. Make them feel welcome. May this jubilee give us, as a denomination, an opportunity for a new beginning, for restoration, for rebuilding and revival. I just say some things about the way forward. And I've got a first point I refer to as talk and act now. I think we talk a lot, we pass so many resolutions, but nothing is done. But if we try to act a lot more, then we can leave out the church we say we are, a multicultural church. Bikku Paret gives a lot of theories on multiculturalism. And I think the two that may be relevant to our situation here is about assimilation and integration. I would not focus on assimilation, but I think integration is quite important. Because it is whereby we welcome people from all over the world as they join us, they learn from us. But also we learn from them, but they do not lose their identity. Also going forward, I, I, I advise that we embrace Charles Taylor's Charles Taylor and Nancy Fraser are multiculturalists. They write a lot on multiculturalism. But Charles Taylor's principle of equal rights 
for everyone. And Nancy Fraser's principle of participation and representation, and participation and representation is important and to be exercised in all structures and corridors of power in our church. And our own Tessa Dale Henry Robinson advocates we need to renegotiate the space around the multicultural table of the United Reformed Church. That everyone has a place and a voice around the table. In conclusion, as we move forward towards a diamond jubilee as a denomination, I'm looking 10 years ahead now, I am confident that we will become more evident. It will become more evident that the UFC is a church for all people from all nations. We need to take the lead in the Aspara mission in the United Kingdom as we make global mission a reality in all our structures. There is positivity in diversity. Let us be proud of who we are. Let us move from a church that is constantly fighting to manage decline to a church that puts church growth and evangelism high on its priority list for the next decade as we move towards our Diamond Jubilee. Finally, this is our denomination. It belongs to all of us. Let us build it together. Let us build a, a denomination where our love, the golden chain, binds us together. A place where people from all nations and cultures are welcome, accepted, and valued for who they are. Let us build a denomination where a godly family atmosphere is created, nurtured, and sustained. A place where everyone's gifts and talents are developed and used to their full potential. A place where people are not promoted or appointed because of the color of their skin, but they are bought by the content of their character and qualifications. Let us build a denomination that will attract others to us because they can see and hear that love abounds amongst us. A place where prejudice and discrimination are zero tolerance. A place where unity and love become pillars of our success. Let us build our denomination together now. If not now, when? If not us, who? Thank you. I feel like I should go and sit down, but I will do my best. And we can start with a poem, and uh, thank you Fiona for your introduction and mentioning poetry. That's what I brought mainly to share with you today, and with a few interspersed with some reflections. I'm going to start with a poem. It's called Black. I'm laying the foundation of who I am. Black. If the night sky wasn't inky, could the stars shine so bright? And if there wasn't darkness, tell me, how could light be light? No dark depths of earth, how would the flora grow? Black is essential, don't you know? You tell me black is no good, the shade of evil, shade of sin. How do I then make sense of the blackness of my skin? The skin I didn't choose, no more than you could choose your own. The skin that I was gifted, only skin I've ever known. Black is what I am, it's who I am, it is my pride. It's the strength on which I stand, where I refuse to be denied. Black speaks of where I'm going, 
how the world relates to me. Black speaks of where I've come from, heritage and history. But it's hard not to internalize the message all around before a word is spoken that in black offense is found. Explicit or implied, yet from your view you cannot see the shackles to be broken until black lives full and free. I'm talking back to John's paper. Traditionally, we understand talking back as being something rather insolent and out of order. As I, as I said that this is what I was going to do, I tried to picture myself telling my dad, I'm going to talk back to you, daddy. And I'm just a picture of what he would say back to me. <laughs> he wouldn't be nice. <laughs> you don't talk back, especially to your seniors. But today, I'm going to dare to talk back, knowing that I do so with utmost respect for this senior, and I'm not talking about age, John. I'm talking about <laughs> This colleague, this brother, I'm going to talk back using my own journey before and through the URC. And I'm going to talk back carrying the weight of testimonies shared with me even during my two years in post as Secretary for Global and Intercultural Ministries. See that? I remembered it myself. <laughs> I'm going to talk back using poetry which is something I don't spend enough time on at the moment because my head and my heart are so taken up with the things that I used to process through verse. And I'm going to continue now with a poem that I was invited to write back in 2011 for the URC's multicultural celebration. And it feels very apt. As we're thinking about the contribution of black and ethnic minority people to the URC, Referring back to the URC's multicultural celebration seems very apt. And this particular poem is called Feast. So again, as we celebrate the URC's jubilee, this theme of feast seems apt. And I should say, maybe I shouldn't, but I will. The poem is a bit autobiographical. So as I start to talk, I'm actually talking about my family, but then I'm going on and I'm thinking about the church and I'm thinking about the world and just asking you to bear in mind all that John has shared and how what I'm saying now might relate to that. Mommy says come, for the feast is spread. She cracks the sweet between her teeth. A piece for you, a piece for me. No one on top, no one beneath. Daddy says come, a treat for you. A pound to share for seven hands, and youthful minds can rest content. Each one their share full understands. But that was then, a simpler time, held safe within a warm embrace, to twist and grow and push and test. But no, my place was mine, my place. And this is now, a different world, a life to live beyond the fold, holding tight to what I've known to keep me safe against the cold. For in this world, one thing I've learned, my place no longer is secure. And who or what or where I am, of these I simply can't be sure. For every time I plant my feet, say this is me, and make a stand, someone, something, within, without, redraws the line in shifting sand. Mummy says come, for the feast is spread, from all directions we would fly, all different and yet all the same, beneath a daddy's watchful eye. Ah, this is life, but soon we'd learn that life is not a simple fare, which welcomes each and welcomes all, and gives and takes our measured share. And I don't grudge the other's lot, don't ask for free what I could earn, and neither want to hold inside that which I have and could return. Mommy says, come, for the feast is spread. We were too young yet to conceive. We had gifts too that we could give, so we were happy to receive. They say, come, a feast is spread. Come join us in our happy throng. Come sing and dance and praise like us. Then to our feast you will belong. There's no difference, we're the same before the God who made us all. So hurry now from every place in answer to the open call. But don't you see, we're not the same. We're different as we're meant to be. For God created humankind in all our rich diversity. 
The feast you've spread, no feast at all, if nothing there from my own hand. The finest food which you have laid becomes for me quite simply bland. If only some provide the fare, tell me, have you never thought? Some guests might just feel ill at ease. The food and drink might just run short. For if the feast is yours to spread, the gifts are only yours to give. You set the limits for your guests, what they can be, how they can live. <coughs> Where then the space to twist and test, the space in which we all can grow, held safe within a warm embrace, with none above and none below. And so instead of bring and share, like 5,000 did before, let's bless, give thanks, whatever comes, and have enough, and so much more. Daddy says come, my feast is spread, from all directions heed my call, lay your gifts and take your place at my feast that spread and shared by all. So John has highlighted the waves of migration from different parts of the globe into the, into the UK and into the URC. He speaks of these successive peoples being welcomed, but raises the question as to how the URC has responded to their presence, our presence, my presence. I was speaking to a friend a few days ago. He is British born to Jamaican parents, which is the same as I am actually. He is now in his mid-60s, and he's been a member of the URC since I think Adam and Eve were still doing their thing. <laughs> and he said to me, as we talked about welcome, he said, he doesn't want to be welcomed. He said, how can he be welcomed to his own church? Who can welcome him to his own church? John reminded us that in 2012, the URC declared itself a multicultural church with an intercultural habit. I think what I want to say is, we are multicultural. The different cultures are definitely present. But are we intercultural? A place where the different cultures are allowed to make a difference. Where all risk being mutually inconvenienced. And an aside, thank you to Michael Jagasa for that phrase. <laughs> all risk being mutually inconvenienced in order to create a new place, a new being, in which all are not just welcome, but have true belonging. Who occupies which spaces at the table? As we celebrate our jubilee, as we enjoy the feast, I ask this question. Will black and ethnic minority people be perpetual welcome guests at the URC table? Or will we be given space and grace to help shape a table that is equally ours. John mentioned the 40 or so ministers from black and ethnic minority backgrounds currently serving in the URC. Not all of them have notched up 29 years service, John, you see, he's our, he's our senior. But all are responding to their call. All are offering their gifts through this church, their church, our church, the United Reformed Church. And in my two years in post, repeatedly, I've heard the question from different individuals, mainly ministers, in different spaces. Does the URC know, Karen? Does the URC know? Do they have any idea what we negotiate day after day after day in the UK, but far more painfully right here within our church? And I've told them, I think the answer is no. The church doesn't know. But I'm committed to finding ways to make those voices heard and for us to get to know. So I offer this next poem as a glimpse. It's titled, Do They Know? And very much based on the testimony that I've been shared with you. Do they know, Karen? Does the URC know? All that we face, day out and day in, what we see, what we hear, what we take in our stride, how it means, sorry, what it means, how it feels to walk in our skin. 
Can they imagine the sting standing fresh in the church, offering gifts of talent and time and much more, to be told you're not needed for this nor for that? We've called on a colleague who was here before. Do they know how it burns when the message is shared? She says she's not coming on any such day that you lead, that you preach, because she insists she can't understand a word that you say. Do they have any idea just how much it smarts when a colleague in color seeks to keep me in check, says, I welcome your faults in the pews, but cannot accept a white collar around a black neck? When we look around and see so many ways we uphold this church, our church, across this land. Then look beyond local, see our spaces dissolve, and hear the view that perhaps this is all as God planned. Do they know, Karen, does the URC know just what we encounter while they say we belong? What it means to be black in this church, our church? Please hear what we see, see that something is wrong. John spoke of being hopeful as we move ahead. And I think John is definitely optimistic. Yes. I love him because while so many people are focusing on managing our death, John is talking about our diamond jubilee. And I'm thinking, way wonderful, <laughs> absolutely. And you know, I am hopeful too. Even in as much as I'm sharing with you, I think some people, maybe they kind of believe or want to think that I'm angry that we're angry and all kinds of stuff. I can tell you, I'm not angry. I'm not angry. What I am is hopeful. Amen. I don't, I don't expect that someone who hasn't had to see through my eyes or walk in my shoes or live in my skin would automatically understand the issues and how it feels. But we're trying to share. We're trying to help people, to bring people on a journey. If after I have finished, if after while I'm making that effort, if people still insist on not understanding and still insist on continuing to get it wrong, at that point, then you might see me angry. Right now, you don't see me angry. You don't see me angry. I am hopeful. I feel possibilities in the air. But I also know how easily we might miss the God-given moments for transformation. I see the efforts of black colleagues and white colleagues who have worked and worked hard to transform the URC table over many, many years. I hear their frustrations over resolutions passed, but nothing much changing. I listen to the weariness of those who have given all that they could and are still committed to the cause of racial justice in our church, but feel they have to pass the baton on because they are spent. I also hear the resistance of those who cannot or will not acknowledge that there is any issue to be addressed. And I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. It hurts. Sometimes it has really, really hurt. I see it. I hear it. I feel it. But I am hopeful. If I wasn't hopeful, I would need to pack my metaphorical bags and seek belonging somewhere else. And I have to tell you, I don't know how to travel light, so I don't want to do any backpacking. <laughs> Way too inconvenient. But I believe that God has called me to hear, to hear. This quirky, imperfect, funny, strange, traveling, all that stuff. This entity called the United Reformed Church. God has called me here just as God has called you here, just as God has called all our black and ethnic minority members from around the globe, all of us called here to the URC table. This is our church, our jubilee. But a final question, can we, will we, loosen our grip enough to give everyone place and belonging in the land that is the United Reformed Church? That's my hope. But we'll see. I'm going to share with you another poem, which I think.
think holds that vision and was also written for a URT multicultural celebration some years ago. <laughs> called A Table for All. Come as you are, because you are welcome. Come take your place and hear now the call. The table is spread and the music is playing. Come take your place at the table for all. Don't ponder now who you think is worthy, when, where, or how RSVP they sent. Instead, come with gladness and joy overflowing, for each person present was God's first intent. No special place for royal or mighty, earthly wealth and position, a thing of the past. At the table prepared with upside down values, where the last shall be first and the first shall be last. No longer division between haves and the have-nots. Here no oppressed, neither those who oppress. Where the world has said no to dignity of justice, our God at his table says yes. And don't be fooled into thinking God does not see color. God's table for all is no sea of gray. God creates and admires and declares it is good, no matter what racist or bigot may say. God calls to his people from every direction, from the east to the west, the north and the south. There's drink for the thirsty of every nation, a banquet abundant for every mouth. A rainbow of women and men at God's table, different languages, customs, and faiths from all lands, invited to sit, talk, and learn all together, more human made by the joining of hearts and of hands. So come sit with prince, and come sit with pauper, with old and with young, freely come take your rest. Whatever the label, the burden you carry, lay it down, for now you are most honored guest. And let us not wait to dine at that table, for though it's not yet, the table is now, where valleys are filled and mountains are level, and a sharing of fate emerges somehow. Oh, the table is spread, and the music is playing. Let's listen and hear and respond to God's call, and live into being the kingdom we cry for, the table with room for all.